Thank you, David, for the very kind introduction. And as David said, it was nerve-wracking to get ready to speak here. Even last time I spoke was a big stadium, but I didn't know them. That was OK. So, uh, so here I'd like to share basically some experience. My group has been working and tried to uh, export what our experience through these three principles for data science. So, and much of it, both examples will come from my long-term collaboration with Jäger Lanz Lab, neuroscience here. So since I claim this to be three principles for data science, and I like to get a definition going on data science. I hope that that's a Berkeley definition. Definitely with all the committees I've sitting on for the last couple of years, and now we have a new division that I think is agreed upon. So there's three important components of data science, and this is uh, come with one diagram. Computer science, math and stats, and data uh, domain knowledge. And some people argue that data science is an intersection, and some people argue it's a union. But I think for the team, I think you want to have all three components covered, and machine learning is at the interface of computer science and statistics. I think both fields own machine learning. There's something else between computer science and domain knowledge I didn't put here called danger zone, right? That actually came from my computer science uh, uh, co-instructors last semester in DS100. So data science is really the re-emerging of computational institute thinking in the context of domain uh, problems. And these three components is really reflected in our data eight with co-design course by CS STEM faculty and also connector courses. Uh, a bit history in order is that actually it's less well known that 1890, a US census was predicted to take 13 years. And a statistician called Hallerworth was charged with the task of speeding up the tabulation of the data. And he invented the uh, Hallerworth tabulating machine, which and he had a company. And the company was one of the four that merged to become IBM. So there, actually, the census is the most, I would say, uh, essential definition of statistics at the historically was really driving the computing devices. And the more modern time, Fisher, who is, owns not just statistics as a, some field he founded or helped founded, and also statistical genetics. So very much now with molecular genomic, but a lot of the thinking and the statistical model are very related. So he was a geneticist, and he was very much a scientist first. And at the time, he was actually not a professor of statistics at Cambridge University. I was very surprised when I visited there recently and discovered that he was never a member of the statistical laboratory there. So this, all these things are already in the history of statistics, but now we have more people to join us, and uh, hopefully we'll push things further without a clear boundaries. So machine learning has emerged for the last two decades a very uh, hot area, both in CS and statistics. I think statistics owns machine learning. CS people for a few ways, we can co-own it. And machine learning really took one part of statistics, like prediction, which was always there, but was not at the center, and made it a center of um, machine learning. Prediction is something very, very easy to explain. Actually, now I teach my statistics course, start with prediction before we go to inference. And cross-validation was also enabled because computation advances that you can shuffle the data many times and redo the calculation. And both with uh, optimization formally introduced into uh, thinking when you design algorithm really uh, propelled the huge development in machine learning with huge uh, successes in um, many different fields. So I talked about Fisher. I see actually cross-validation really embodies this uh, replication principle from science. It's like a pseudo replicates. Ideally, we like to have another lab replicate the discoveries. When we have data relatively symmetric and not too dependent, you kind of cook up different replicates by deleting one part, say that's set aside, and then cycle through. And this is the idea of cross validation, which came from two statisticians, uh, Stone and Allen, in 1973. But some of us, I mean, people use it, but it's not like everybody was using it. But machine learning made it like everybody was using prediction. Everything was massaged into a prediction frame. And it's a concept everybody understands because we do prediction every day uh, to live. And this just really, really made uh, the accessibility, applicability of a lot of basic ideas much, much, much broader audience. So the the requirement was not like two years of statistical courses anymore. It was something you can do very quickly. And because empirical, <coughs> you can look at empirical prediction errors, you have some protection against overfitting. Not always, but 
<coughs> so this is really, in a way, uh, application of scientific principle of replication using the data you have. As I said, prediction cross-validation with um, optimization, data availability, and both very conceptually very simple. Open source software, so really took off. Most of the time, people basically talk about machine learning. I mean, in the place I would say statistics. I use them also exchangeably. So now I think machine learning kind of circled back to, oh, statistics is something statistics always concerned about, which is interoperability. And cross-validation even is very good at most of the time, preventing from overfitting for prediction, but not for interpretation. If you look at a lot of data, like deep learning is an example, that prediction we do really well for uh, where is a dog, you know, what's a cat. But if you look at the parameters, you cannot interpret. It's millions and millions of them. And uh, EU put forward some regulation last year saying that now users have a right to explanation and demands basically ML and statistic algorithm to be humanly interpretable. Uh, interpretation actually is not well defined if you think about it. You can have interpretability at algorithmic sense means that it's simple enough you can look at, but also depends on who is this person. Right? Somebody trained in mathematics will think an algorithm is interpretable in a different way as somebody trained in another field who is not very mathematically trained. So the user has to come in. But it's safe to say that we want at least most people can look at things. Then therefore, you cannot have too many terms, things that cannot be too complex. And you have a variability, but everybody agree that deep learning is not interpretable. Right? When you go to like 6 million or 60 million parameters, it's just beyond interpretability. Some people say, I can interpret 100 parameters. I can do only 20. But there's a magnitude. When you go to a few hundreds, probably most people would say. So kind of um, driven by the date, a lot of the work actually I did with Galan's lab is I kind of start try to unify and build a platform to integrate huge amounts of work in the literature through the umbrella of stability. In a way, I see it, I mentioned cross-validation. It's a way to say, let's look at statistical replicability with the same data. A lot of statistics work has been trying to do things with one copy of data. And you basically have to make assumptions and to make sure that you can kind of replicate in a pseudo way the original data generation process. So I argue that this was a 2013 paper. Central limb theorem, hopefully most of you have heard of, is basically if I have things relatively independent, you sum them up, properly normalize, they, you have the bell curve coming out. And this is, was actually on uh, German's uh, ten marks. It was very important. It's also called Gaussian curve. And that was really a building block, a cornerstone for uh, classical theoretical statistics. And there's a way to look at it, saying that it's actually a stability result. One proof is, you know, well, uh, well-known mathematician, and uh, Terence Tau has a blog. He has seven proofs of central limb theorem. The way I learned it was not the one I'm going to tell you. It's basically saying that you have all these loosely dependent things, you add them up, and you can prove things by take one away and put another one with the same distribution. It's something called Lindbergh swapping trick. And you say that actually the limiting, when things get big, things still get the same limiting result, approximately. And this way, you can actually show that the only distribution is normal distribution. So it's really in underneath is a stability result. And without stability, statistics really wouldn't be called a science. It's just all transient phenomenon. And the modern random matrix result also can be seen that way. So stability is really hardcore at the fundamental laws we build on. Uh, in the literature, you can go back to the 40s. Jack Knife is removing one data point at a time. It's basically uh, stability. Now, machine learning people call algorithmic stability. You move one at a time. And you do model selection in the 70s, and lasso, which is L1 penalized least squares, and clustering, causal inference, and differential privacy. So all of these people concern about stability. And I recently met a philosopher, scientific, uh, science, uh, philosopher of science, who pointed me, I said, this must be something people have been thinking about. It's so common sense, stability. And he pointed me to some writing or some expert from uh, Plato 
is from stability of knowledge, right? So this goes back a long way, but I'm talking about much narrow sense, but it's related. If we think we are working toward knowledge, then if you delete a few data points, your knowledge change. That seems very perturbing, at least to me. And that's actually where I started. I was working with Jack's lab, and they collect the data, I'll show you, like two hours. And it's like, why not two hours and 10 minutes? And that's where the stability actually, I um, start thinking, I've been talking to Peter about it, uh, on and off, right? And robust statistics is something I never learned very well in graduate school, and now it's very relevant. And so here, what I try to do is give a few kind of criteria for people to compare and talk. So you need to define a way of perturbing either your data or your model. This is kind of my contribution, I unified the two. People have been perturbing data, people have perturbing models, but now let's think of them the same way. They're all perturbation to what you do. And this appropriate rate is very, very heavily loaded. That's all the hard work you have to do to really make the case why you get something quite similar to the original data generation process. And also define the stability measure. For prediction, I said deep learning is very relatively stable, but for interpretation, it's completely instable. So you have to define what's the relative metric you care about, even the same method. So these are the common ones. I'm kind of assuming things are relatively not too dependent and exchangeable. And statistics we call IID, independent identity distributed. So cross-validation I talked about. You can do bootstrap. It's a basic subsampling with replacement. And subsampling with, means without replacement. And other forms. But I also want to have the umbrella in also on campus something kind of new to statistics. So I remember it was a talk by a Peter Abuse group, probably um, Sergei Levin gave the talk, that he was putting data simulated from PDE of arms, robotic arm reaching, together with real data observed from humans. So this is another form of perturbation from so mechanistic simulation models. Uh, under stability umbrella, they can be considered. So it's tried to, and then of course, dynamic systems always had concept stability. And you know, the L2 panel Lattice square came from um, inverse problem, by solving integral equations. So it's about, again, actually stability consideration. So there are many, many people have thought about stability. And it's really a positive way of saying instability, right? That's about uncertainty, right? We tend to say that, you know, we're about uncertainty. It's just, when you say, oh, I seek stability, it's the same thing, but it sounds more positive. And model perturbation, as I mentioned, robust statistics, people have done that, consider two models, and you look at your procedure and say that, hey, under the two models, my procedure should be giving me sensible results. Not just optimal, only under one model. Uh, Semi-parametric models, definitely, you leave one part of model pretty vague and one part kind of with parameter parametric. And what I will talk about in the talk later is that we have 18 models built on deep learning. They give similar prediction performance, and we try to do some neuroscience with it, right? So this, this proliferation of models before 20 years ago, you barely can make one model work. Now you can easily try hundreds of models. And how, what do you do, right? Do you pick the, the cutest or uh, some other way, right? But does it hold up? So that's what I call a PCS, PSC workflow. You start with prediction, very much building on machine learning, saying that I use prediction as a goodness, modern goodness of fit, right? Constant is very stable. Most people wouldn't be interested in this room about constant, right? So whatever you do have to be uh, fitting the data well. And then I go for stability, which is a simplified form of uncertainty, which if I make it more, um, Sophisticated, I go back to uncertainty. But I tried that with DS100 last year with stability concept. Sometimes, you, even for explore data analysis, you might want to perturb your data if you can justify it's good to do that. And then see how the patterns change. So it's something throughout. You don't have to wait for the quantitative phase. Even for looking at the data, any phase you can do that. If some pattern disappear when you change the data by 10 points or something, then you probably don't want to trust that pattern too much. And then, you seek interoperability. So it's not like anything stable is interpretable, but if things are not stable, I don't think you should want to interpret it. 
because it's just fleeting. And then, of course, computations, we're building on stochastic gradient, one way or the other. So there's some strategic connection I'll mention at the end of the talk. So for the rest of the talk, um, I will mention two projects. One is looking at perturbing the data. The other, perturbing the model. Or what, I have 18 of some models that give me very similar prediction. And how do I uh, consolidate the different patterns and reach uh, some interpretable result in terms of characterizing the neural functionality? So here's something also I want to say, uh, because data science, I think this actually bit is very much not just doing data science, it's about the scientific environment of doing data science. So personally, I have come to this conclusion that I would like to embed myself in a scientific or domain problem first and make it work. I have tons of validations before I believe that's a general method. That's the power of statistics or machine learning is that kind of the off-shelf characteristic of it, something you can borrow and use. But I think, in my view, this has a higher chance for it to be useful for another problem than you just dream up, you know, um, of it. I think when you, people have a lot of data experience like Leo Bryman, I think they probably warp a lot of things in, but I think as somebody younger, I just don't, it's like, sometimes you do. I have been asking for examples that came completely from pure, like, theoretical, and I did find one which is the Ada boost. So far, whatever the history I could collect seemed to imply that it came more from the theoretical end. But many people build on top of each other. The first version actually was not practical. So you still take many people to make it practical. So the first project, Jack is the second person, was a it's kind of old project, has been, uh, was published in 2011 in current biology. And my uh, team is Yuva Benjamin now back in Israel, and Shinji now professor in, uh, back in Japan. So this is the team. That's the first kind of project we work with Jack. We have been working together for 10 years. And data was collected by Jack's lab. So it's fMRI. Everybody heard about fMRI? Um, it's not direct uh, neural measurements. It's indirect, has pretty good uh, temporal and spatial coverage. It really measures oxy oxygenated blood flow. So you could also measure things about housekeeping, and you have to do a lot of pre-processing, which we didn't touch, to get the data I'll be showing you. And a human subject was lying under the uh, campus uh, fMRI machine watching clips of movies. So here's the data. So on this hand was what the clip uh, the person was looking at. We had three subjects, and this is the uh, visual cortex and now flattened for easy visualization. So blue means, this is process data, to try to remove heartbeat and some systematic uh, patterns that we don't think had anything to do with the vision. But of course, you can remove things too. Um, and blue means the brain gets bored, and red, the brain excited. You can see that we have very little patience, actually. We get bored very quickly. So that's why, that's my argument for why we need to go for new names. Right, there has been a debate in statistics of why we should have a new name, but I'm now completely convinced by this data that we should go for new names because we, we, show we, we are very interested in new things. Otherwise, we don't get atten you know, attention, we get bored very quickly. You can see that we get cool very, very quickly, and the fire, like variability. It's hard, I think it's hard to predict we show a lot of attention. So the clips, um, this work wouldn't have been possible without all the availability of movie clips, movie trailers, YouTubes, go back 20 years, wouldn't have been possible. This basic database of movie clips served like, like a prior experience. We have a lot of prior experience stored in our brain. And this kind of server engineering way of capturing that. And then we realized very quickly that actually the reason we have very blurred images. So this is, we developed a forward model and we have much better data, 10 replicates, replicates, and took an average for, without touching the input, we're just gonna use the forward model and the observed fMRI to do the inversion or decoding of the brain, or try to guess what the image the person was looking at. In the end, we end up with 26,000 dimensions, and one million movie clips basically just disappears. And a lot of that, I think if we have all the movies, clips only by people talking, I think we can do a lot better. But uh, we didn't do that. It's just um, something we tried a little bit. But 
people move on with their lives. So. And as I said, the key in this uh, project is actually the Gabor feature extraction, which is huge amount of work starting in the 50s by uh, Wiesel and Hubble. Physiology and Bruno and David Fields' work from the data end. So it's huge amount of work that people made it into a mathematical formula, just made a fixed filter band. This is basically what deep learning learns, the first, not about the, the time part, but for static images, that's based the first layer of deep learning. You learn with huge amount of data. But already we had the mathematicalization of this Gabor, so we can have fixed filters, basically linear inner product, and act on the images and do the future extraction. After that, become quite simple. Some version of penalize these squares. But huge amount of work went to the design of that Gabor filter. It's not just the idea, but it's also good engineering uh, that uh, Shinji and Yuval did. So everybody knows these squares, right? So you try to minimize something which in the end you have, this is the, the, the counter plot. And then L1 penalize saying that I'm not going to go to the middle where the dot is. I'm going to put a constraint, which is L1, which is sparse. So you force the solution more on the corners, not always. Then you get sparsity. So this is a convex optimization problem that fueled a huge amount of research. And actually, for this problem, it works really well. And uh, so as I said, the Gabor filters, it's about frequency, orientation, and location. So each filter somehow I can put it on my map of images, kind of takes features from that location and do something about it, either get the edge detector or frequency. And what I plotted is cross-validations like with Lasso. And this is suggesting, I'll call this scientific recommendation system. That's how I got into causal inference too. It's like, now I can look at all the locations. Each column is a uh, voxel. This is suggestive saying that these locations, the features from these locations, are predictive of this voxel's responses. Maybe they're driving it too, right? So now I'm jumping from association to causation. And our version, but it's all over the map, right? Which scientifically, very neuroscience people didn't quite believe it because usually we are more localized. And if we we'll add stability to it, we can really shrink the possible candidate to something much smaller. And in theory, we can put in one of the dots some animated features and then do intervention and prove actually this voxel cares this location, this type of feature. But again, that hasn't been done because we need money to use the FMR machine. So, um, so this is um, adding stability to cross-validation, right? As I said, I'm taking a modern approach to statistics. I use prediction error as my first benchmark. I only look at the models which good the best of the prediction. And then I add stability, right? So it kind of reverse. Instead of going for p-values confidence, I go for prediction error first. And if you look at this particular problem, I was willing to sacrifice prediction accuracy for the sake of interoperability. And it turns out that prediction error for this data barely changed, reduced by 1.3%, basically didn't change. But the size of the model got reduced to 60%. So it's a huge gain for this problem. And you can see it's not just in terms of size, but all in terms of biological interoperability because it's become local, right? It's not all over the place with the same number and made more biological sense. So this is what the first success, adding stability to uh, cross-validation. And the way we designed estimation stability can be now interpreted, we didn't come out this way, as a way of testing this uh, linear regression function being zero or something, stability through a deleted JJ nice. So I won't tell you more. Uh, I can give you the formula if you're interested. So the idea is I start with the model chosen by cross-validation. And then I make my smoothing parameter bigger or my model smaller. The smoothing parameter is really saying how big my uh, constraint should be, right? So I want the smaller model closest to the cross-validation choice. And I have a metric, I hit the local minimum, I stop. That's what I showed you, with the more coherent um, locations for the parameters. So that's where we were, right? Ideally, we should do the experiment, which hasn't happened. And then we start working with uh, Jack 
lab on another project, which is V4. So um, actually, Risa and Yuan Si are somewhere here. Uh, so they're the main force. And Adam now at Google and Mike, I think, went to Allen Institute. And Ben Wilmore collected data with a postdoc Jack, now at Oxford. It took two years to work with uh, behaving macaque. So it was very precious data about 10 years ago. So the movie reconstruction I showed you, actually, we only had good forward model uh, for V1 and V2. So there are two main uh, information, uh, thank you, like uh, pathway forward. One is what, one is where. So I'm looking at the what pathway. V1 is like edge detectors, and V2 kind of similar. V4, it's very difficult. People have done very controlled experiment, say giving geometric controlled curvature and some texture. So there are conjectures using um, or prove, you know, people believe that's what it does, but it's very controlled environment. Uh, on the other hand, so we devised actually using uh, sparse coding in two layers got state-of-the-art prediction performance for V4. So for the movie reconstruction, because we didn't have good forward model, the data for reconstruction was only about V1 and V2. We actually didn't use V4 data because we didn't have good prediction model. So we were pretty successful using two layers of parse coding. And then deep learning became such a hype, right? And then I'll give a talk. Benji was talking after me two or three years ago at JSM. And we look around, it's like, oh, God, I had my self-made deep learning network with very little data. And then he was talking about you know, big data and all that. So the question is, does deep learning really beat our handmade model, small network for our data? And we tried. This guy tried, Ariza, Yuanzi, and he beat us slightly. That's where I became a deep learning researcher. <laughs> right, because I had my two best people, one computer vision, one applied statistics. I told Jack that if they fail, I'll out of this project, <laughs> right? And then we did, and Jack was very, you know, skeptical whether we could do it. But we did it, and then this thing just made it better. So I said, there's something there. I have to look. So, so the project became twofold. In the beginning, we started with just understand we fall, but then it's kind of hinges at AI, right? Many people ask about AI questions, and I'm kind of statistician. I'm reading a bit on the history. It's completely not completely educated yet. But I think the AI approach right now is very statistical. There were phases, they were more into symbolic, uh, made to agents, or that. but right now it's actually in a very statistical phase. I hope we'll move to something prettier mathematically, but also works. But right now it's really statistical. It's basically turning into supervised learning and with the, the workhorse of stochastic gradient descent or gradient descent. But I think the AI challenge is really reproduced intuition or the unconscious brain. It's hard because we don't even know what that is for humans, right? So, but I think AlphaGo, I think it's impressive. But I do think that AlphaGo is something uh, took a lot of energy to, uh, to uh, devise. And somebody told me that to run the computer for AlphaGo and now it's like $3,000. And so I think more fair comparison of AlphaGo and human players should be normalized by the energy consumption. <laughs> Otherwise, cannot be scaled up, right? It's just, it's great. I mean, it's very impressive. And there's things we cannot do, AlphaGo can do. But um, I don't think we want to exchange a human for AlphaGo yet. So I'm of the view that humans will always lead, but there will be human and machine collaboration. And I think I'm safe in my lifetime. That will be what's happening. So we said, with this uh, deep learning connection, we set up two questions. How much the convolutional network, which is one form of uh, deep learning, really can give us evidence on resemble brain function? Actually, I'm convinced that we, we lend a tiny bit you know, evidence to support that the image net trained deep learning capture, at least early on, something about the brain function, at least from the empirical performance. And the second, which we started with, is can we now characterize V4 neurons building on deep learning? So as I said, we have this earlier paper, Mariah Tao is still being written. That's one thing, working with uh, a top scientist. Um, we are still writing it, or Jack still writing it. Um, but we moved on, and then the Carlos group, actually at MIT, is on a very parallel path. 
And their image is a little different. We have um, natural images. They have this object imposed on natural images, so semi-natural <coughs> images. And they actually published paper already using first their design deep learning and later they did them for V4 and IT. First, we, we were disappointed that they already did a, a prediction part of work. But actually, it was good because we replicate independently of work. It should be a good thing instead of like, why we're not the first. But we do now concentrate more on interpretation because the prediction part they have done. But actually, it's good that we replicated the results completely independently. And it shouldn't be a bad thing. We sometimes thinking that we're not the first, therefore it's bad. So the data was collected a long time ago, right? So black and white. And there were two behaving macaques, small primates. And uh, they got fixated to a certain location. Doesn't mean they don't get distracted, spaced out, but we hope they don't because otherwise we won't be able to predict. And that's the image, a few thousands. So what we do is actually very much called transfer learning. Transfer learning, roughly speaking, is about you change the setup from your training data to what you do, use it for. So we have state-of-the-art prediction performance, and it's transferred in three different senses, which I will articulate in the next slide. We also go for stable interpretation of the best prediction models for characterized neurons. So here's the uh, schematic drawing of uh, ImageNet data-driven AlexNet. So ImageNet is about 15 million labeled uh, images. So really, the success is not exactly AI in the original sense. The success of AlexNet is really again, a human-machine collaboration, because these images are labeled. Who labeled them? Human. That's human intelligence right there, vision. And with McCartney Turks and Fei Fei Li's group is really um, responsible. It's a huge contribution to have made this database. So it's black and white. It's color images. And our image is black and white. So what we did, we just put three channels the same intensity, made it pretty you know, rough color image. And we took the first two layers, later we talked about more layers, as completely black box, fitted with image net and as in, like image uh, feature extraction. And the task was labels. And we transferred to very low level neuron activities. And that's human data, this is macaque. Right? So the domains are quite different. And then we compare it with our benchmark, three two-layer sparse coding model, and beat it. Right, that's where uh, I became a deep learner. And a bit history of uh, artificial network, that's whatever I, this is not from deep learning, right? This is from pretty shallow learning from the web. That at least it goes back to the 40s. It was a collaboration between neuroscientists and mathematicians. And Hab's work is pretty well known. And then kind of in the 70s, US AI went into a pretty winter period. However, in Japan, Amari, they had a lot of good work done, but not as well known to the US. Some of the paper was published in Japanese. So they call nerves networks, right? So maybe at the time, probably there was no Google, so we couldn't search easily. And how field, and then the bad propagation. So I find it from my source on the web, it's like seem to Rumor Hart, Hinton, and Williams. And I met a former student, Hinton, at KDD. And he said, Hinton would say that actually the main idea came from Rumor Hart. Right, that's about my uh, history. So there was a lot of work. For example, in Amari's work in the 70s, 60s, he already talked about Settle Point. And so a lot of things we are now coming back to was already there. And for people who don't know deep learning, it's actually quite simple structure. So you take one of the hidden nodes, you have linear weights, and you have a summation, and you have activation function, I'll show you. And then you might have a softmax or something for output. So it's very decomposable. Each structure locally is very similar. That's the nice thing about it. And these are the few activation functions. Okay, so similar, you want to have the compressive effect. Because when the image intensity goes up, the neuron are going to follow. You're going to tip it down because you have energy constraint. So you do want things. This one, you have a little problem, but I think people can have ways to deal with it. Even for the rattle, it's more nuanced. 
So fitting a weight in deep net, so it used to be much harder. Now people claim there's a way you can do things pretty well. Multiple starting points, at least a lot easier. Back propagation, which is gradient descent, or stochastic gradient descent, and you basically have a test error. You have lots of data, stop. It's kind of you using this huge parametric family, but technically it's really non-parametric because it's so, hu so huge that guides you to get almost like our oh, call existing parametric family out. And your test set is like a new data sampling split, which goes back a long way also in statistics, to fit now not the calculus-driven family, but algorithmic-driven family, and you're doing something like a maximizer. So it's really the path doesn't have to be one-dimensional, but it's low-dimensional. It's not a few million dimension. So using the data to learn a representation. And the local modes, actually, I see each local mode as a model. And this parameterization, the universal parameterization, actually make jumping around very easy and therefore ease the computation. So it's really a computation machine. And CNA is a special form of a deep learning network. For all the weights I told you, you're basically saying that if the weights have different location, uh, constrain them to be the same because I don't believe the different future or different location is different because we have this invariance. We see a table here and there, and you want to build that in. So it's a constrained general deep learning network. <coughs> Again, the work at least goes back to a uh, Japanese researcher in the 80s and some later ones by Yang Lacan's group. So this is the images from ImageNet, right? Cephalis group, and about 15 million, and people have been using for uh, computation design. So with the same data, there at least there's now ResNet I won't talk about because the work is kind of done. Um, it's three deep learning networks with different similar structures. And they kind of have improved performance on the ImageNet proper test set. And some of them have 4 million data parameters, others have 60 million. So it's not something you can look at. But you can look at their output and they seem to do pretty well. Um, tell from a dog, from a cat. And this is just AlexNet, this is a Google Net. So they're not exactly the same. So back to this. So one question is, now I have three deep learning nets from the same data by different groups using the same data. Which one do I use? Right? And then for regression, for the, se for the second part after the feature extraction, at least I can do L2 penalized regression or L1 penalized regression. So I have two. So easily I got six models. So now I'm going to use prediction and visualization as my stability measure to reach some consensus. So I'm only going to take the ones with similar prediction performance. So this is different layers of deep learning from AlexNet. And the purple is the Gabor. This is saying that V4 neurons definitely is not Gabor, except some of them like Gabor type of neurons. And you go to layer two, three, four, five, they actually give very similar average prediction performance. I'm using correlation as performance because for physiology, you cannot really predict the magnitude because you don't know the energy for the new data, so we use correlation as the prediction error. The higher the correlation, the better the prediction. So I'll concentrate on two and say a little bit about the four, uh, three and four. And the three models for this particular neuron give very similar results. So on average, all my six models have correlation and prediction about 0.92%. So they basically give very good similar prediction results. And this is on average. If you use reach, you get 4.4 million. And for that layer, because we're using one layer, and lasso, you get to 400. If you use reach after lasso, you get better performances, and lasso even is constrained, it's not enough regularization. So you can use a bit more, something like ELASNEC would do. And then we took us a long time after the prediction to decide how we're going to characterize the neurons. So after much discussion, we end up using the deep dream. So deep dream, it's also come from the deep learning world. They're very, very good with names. So now I have a model, right? I have an image, high dimensional input, I have a model neuron. I have one-dimensional output supposed to mimic the neuron responses. 
for neuron D. Okay, so the first part is from Alex Nice, second part say from Lasso and from Rich. And I want to look at which part of the image this model neuron, two model neurons, because I have two models for the same neuron, I want to look at consistency. So they see that both models tell me that this neuron cares about that location. The lighter, that means the more interested this uh, neuron is for that location. Because V4 neurons do have higher receptive field because you're going towards object recognition, not local anymore, but still it's not all over the image. Okay, so these are the images from our data set that seem to excite the model neuron. So we're glad to see some consistency between the two and rich. And usually neurons in neuroscience are categorized by the signals the neurons get most excited about. Right, this is called an edge neuron because it cares about, it gets very excited, has a lot of spike train responses when you have an edge. So for V4, for two models, you can see that this is what we call manifold deep dream. So what's deep dream? It's basically you have a fitted model, a one-dimensional function on high-dimensional space. You start from random point and maximize this function until you hit the maximum. But we didn't like the fact that not all possible um, images are natural images, so put some regularity on the path that's what we call manifold deep learning, deep dream. And those are the two images came out from the lasso based Alex Knife and Ridge based. So they're not identical, but human recognize there are some similarities. So that's why you don't want to read too much into that, except that they kind of textured, but regular texture. It's like humans actually see similarities. And uh, we did, I don't have the data, if we use this deep dream images to excite other neural neurons, very clear, they have preference to have their own deep dream images. So it's, there's a lot of separation. This is the inhibitor patterns. Again, you can see that the ridge is refined. It's very regular, there's regularity there, so we can probably safe to say this regular type of patterns, texture patterns, depresses the neuron, but it's very hard to know the period, right? This is much coarser, this is more refined, so we cannot interpret that part. This is probably artifact of the Sioux versus ridge. Right, so that's what we try to interpret. And Rika here, so this fellow, uh, we developed this superheat, try to monitor a high dimensional input um, with the response. So this is a heat map from bioinformatics, but we have added a lot of information on the legend to say that there's a lot of consistency when the iteration goes. We don't want to end up taking the last image and it's very different from the rest. And you see a big kind of bluish block, that's the color filters. And our images are black and white, so there's nothing going on there, which makes sense. And this is the images that excite the neuron from the database. So you can see that it's kind of textured, but not very regular. <coughs> this is our model neuron because but you can see that lasso is not as nicely uh, contiguous as this one because this is picking the sparsity hertz and biologically I think this one makes more sense because we don't think receptive will be picking pixel from all over the place. And this deep dream suggests that this neuron care about this type of curvature. There's a lot of consistency and this is the patterns this neuron get depressed about. And this is just to show that similar superheat. And this is our, I think, our favorite neuron because from the images that excite the model neuron, you can see the curvature very clearly. Right, so we try to use different evidence to put it together to characterize. But a lot of things we cannot pin down because prediction is still too many models have the same prediction. So this is uh, yet another neuron. I think maybe, oh, that's the same one, a double. Oh, I'm going backward, no wonder I doubled. So then let's look at stability across the three deep dream, um, deep nets. Again, you see a lot of consistency. But the images are not as consistent, but the deep dream images are quite consistent. So we're looking for patterns that 
when we have 18 models, they give similar result, and that's the part we, we're happy to interpret. And this is another neuron, you can see. The boundaries are now clear, but the location, the size, are pretty much consistent. And this is 10 neurons. You saw D and E, and this one basically like V1 neuron, it's an edge detector, right? So V4 region still have uh, V1 type of neurons. And this is a pattern neuron, they all have different patterns. So you will feed this deep dream images to the models, they definitely prefer their own deep dream image. So there's a lot of separation for the 71 neuron. For the ones we do decent prediction. Right, so I gave this talk about modern yoga at DeepMind, and you know, there are a lot of deep learning people there that quickly ask a good question, how about layers three, four, and five? You know, we have confirmation bias, we actually want it before map nicely to the second layer. And after they asked the question, we couldn't hide anymore, so we tried actually to do very good prediction performance too. But luckily, all the interpretation is still very stable, but we cannot map the V4 neuron to a nice layer. But why should we, right? That's very artificial. This is pretty much uh, neuroscience based. So, uh, so now we end up basically we have 18 models. We, if we use uh, layer three, layer four, and layer five. They all give very similar prediction performance. So the last bit is that um, there's actually intimate connections quite unexplored between stability and also computability and also prediction error. And how do we characterize computability? Turing computable, that's a great idea, great concept, but it's not very, that's not what we practice. So we went for practical computability. Just look at iterative algorithms and look at convergence rate as a, some form of complexity for computability. We didn't worry about memory and communication, which in the future probably should be in. And I agree with stability, as I said, it's basically jackknife, delete one at a time from the 40s in statistics. And people already made connection between jackknife, experience stability with generalization error, and between generalization error, conversion rate. So our contribution is some much less work, there's some work uh, already between agreement stability and convergence rate. So that's the, the, the space we're working in, and Yuan Xu and Xu Jin. And one thing we learned is that when you do this e to algorithm, as we have seen in some early work, uh, myself and Peter Buman, is that in the beginning, you actually don't have the full complexity of like VC class, like which is measure how complex the whole class are. You really have much constrained complexity. And there's an interplay between the stability of the algorithm and uh, how fast the algorithm can converge. So to summarize, I hope I made some case for you to try this uh, pair, like this workflow of prediction, stability, and computability has always been there. You couldn't do prediction or stability without computability. And uh, for the second part, I hope that you are convinced, like me, that we landed tiny bit of evidence to say that deep learning network built on ImageNet does capture at least early there something about biological. And people have also shown that, we showed some of that, tried to do some proof like gene expression data, it seemed to be pretty good processing there too. For the higher layers, it's hard to say. And there's also a lot of strategic connections between predictability, stability, and computability. And we have tried it adding like stability to random forest, that's another very uh, effective nonlinear method. I think it's better fit for biology. It's for, uh, because the thresholding behavior, I think, is a better match, and deep learning match for cognitive type of task, and also takes money. And this is why we're here, right? I usually give this outside, but in case you don't know, we have a new major coming, and you saw the dean, and DS100 serving 1,000 a semester, and then uh, DS100, which I was part of with Deb Nolan and Joe Hallistan, or oh, Joe Gonzalez and Joe Hallistan, now I think serving most students too, and this is supported by the NS Center for Science, Technology, and NSF ARO, and ONR. Thank you. <laughs>